Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I am your host, PJ Weary, and I'm here today with Dr. Alex Reed, the chair of the Department of Media Study at the State University of New York at Buffalo. It's wonderful to have you here today. Glad to be here. And we're talking about his book, Rhetorics of the Digital Non-Humanities. Uh, I only have the Kindle version here with me, so I can't show like a beautiful uh, version of the cover, but a uh, fascinating book. And uh, just to kind of start us off, what uh, led you to, to write this? Why this book? Oh, well, uh, sure. I mean, I, this is a subject that I've been studying uh, since I went to graduate school in the early 90s. Uh, you know, it's the, that was the moment that um, the internet kind of came alive, right? So uh, that's what had you know, in, uh, started my interest in, in studying the relationship between uh, technology and communication, rhetorical practice, which is uh, what I would say is sort of the backbone of my uh, research, uh, my entire career. <clears throat> and so uh, this particular book is looking at the role that, uh, increasing role that uh, digital media technologies play in shaping our capacities to uh, communicate, to produce knowledge, to share that knowledge with one another, to uh, come to, you know, to make decisions, to come together about issues uh, that we need to address. And uh, I mean, certainly in the last 10 years, uh, from smartphones to social media, now to generative AI, things have changed a lot for uh, people around the world, really. It's interesting, uh, and I don't know if my audience is getting tired of me saying this. It just keeps it comes up with each guest. My day job is I'm a digital marketer, and uh, so just this morning I was talking to my wife. We make websites, and that's been pretty solid for us for several years. And uh, now generative AI, they're now like they they're creating those kind of prompts that like make me a website that does this, and they're like, okay. No need to panic yet, but we definitely need to keep an eye on like <laughs> what kind of market share is that going to take, right? Right. No, absolutely. I mean, this is a concern. My department I'm in now is uh, largely, uh, I mean, we do you know, uh, into humanities and arts. So a lot of our students are filmmakers or game designers, or those are the things they're aspiring to be. So uh, generative AI is a huge issue. It's, I mean, we've had to strike with the screenwriters and things like that. So we are all aware of those kinds of things. Uh, and for our audience, um, one, it's not an uncontroversial uh, definition, like what is rhetoric? Um, <laughs> there's some, that, that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, so if you don't mind kind of articulating what you mean by rhetoric, and then what is the discipline of digital rhetoric to kind of center us as, you know, I mean, even that title of rhetorics of the digital non-humanities, I think if we start off just saying that and not defining it, I think some people are like, I don't, where are we? Where, where are we on the map of like the world? You know, uh, you know absolutely. I mean, the title is a little bit inside baseball, I, I would say. Um, yeah. I've never I mean, heard that term. I like that. Sorry, <laughs> so the, the, you know, the uh, rhetoric, I guess, like the oldest definition we go back to Aristotle is about, uh, you know, the available means of persuasion, you know, uh, understanding the ways that um, you can persuade an audience to take any particular action in language. And so understanding the art of it, right? So there's an art and a practice of rhetoric that's about persuading people, whether you're, you know, in digital marketing or you're a lawyer or you're a teacher or a politician or what, just, you know, trying to get somebody to go out on a date with you. Uh, you know, it's it's about persuasion. Uh, that's the history of it. I mean, I think that uh, a more contemporary definition would look 
more broadly at the ways that we use language and other media to um, produce knowledge, to uh, work together and to persuade, but that persuasion isn't necessarily the central focus that it was as a sort of classical thing. Um, as a, uh, Regarding digital rhetoric, I mean, that's a, uh, a term that was coined in the late 80s and uh, by a guy, a scholar named Richard Lanham, uh, and, um, you know, it came up out with the, you know, like the PC revolution, which started in the late seventies and then, you know, P, you know, computers coming into the workplaces and, and into classrooms in the eighties. And so I think scholars in my field that were teaching writing and thinking about rhetoric were starting to become, pay more attention to the role of computers. And so, uh, that's kind of where that term comes from. So it's really looking at the, specifically at rhetorical practices as they relate to digital media. Um, and I, that obviously leads us into, you know, when you talk about uh, the question about what is, what are non-humans? Oh, yes. Okay. So, well, I mean, that's uh, uh, not us, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, my, I, when you look at, uh, interest, scholarly interest in the non-human. Um, and I talk also about the, about post-human, which is kind of related to that, uh, that non-humans, you know, could be animals. Um, so p there are people that certainly talk about the role of, you know, animals and rhetoric and things of that nature. Uh, my interests are in the technologies as, as uh, actors, you know, as participants. Uh, and not just as, um, you know, the mute uh, extensions of our individual will or something along those lines that they have a, they, that they actually have a part to play. So kind of reassembling them as uh, maybe not what agents might be too strong of word or is that what you'd be looking for versus tools? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, the, the question of agency uh, comes up quite a bit in, in uh, my book and in my work about, you know, where, 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 do the th th where do our thoughts come from? Like, how do they arise? How do we put them into language? How do we decide uh, what we want to do and how we go about it? And uh, so you know, I, would, I always think about uh, our tools as, I mean, you can think about it historically as just a, as a way uh, that we have tried to solidify and regularize the way that we go about com uh, communicating with one another. So, uh, you know, anything from grammar, <laughs> to, you know, th in language to, uh, you know, genres like a memo or an email, like, like those are things that, you know, we don't have to think about how to do because we know how to do them to, and we use them in certain contexts and not others. You know, you don't probably send your wife memos, right? I mean, so, I mean, there's the, <laughs> the you know, there's that kind of thing. So, I mean, I, you know, so understanding like uh, technologies as ways that we have sort of encased or tried to regularize our processes, our human processes and make them easier for us. But at the same time that those things, then we then pick up, right? Because other people make our tools for various reasons and then we use them and try and figure out how to use them. And so... Uh, they they come to have their own um, tendencies, right? For how we use a cell phone versus how we use a pencil, and uh, so how does that how does that work uh, and shape the ways that we decide to communicate? Uh, and I think you know, even as you talk about the difference between a pencil and a uh, cell phone, that are, are we talking about? Uh, you talk about user populations. Are we talking about the, uh, and for you, that's, you, you want to, well, and this is what I, this is what I want to ask you. Are we looking to get rid of uh, completely the ideal persuader, or are we looking to decentralize that and allow it to exist on, along different capacities? Like there's a, there's an ideal, uh, it definitely feels like it's not just a, um, uh, per technology. It would be like, uh, or not a, like a, not like a cell phone or pencil, but it'd be more like. The person who's ideal on Twitter would be different from the person who's ideal on Instagram. <laughs> like those are very different. But right. are you looking to decentralize or are you looking to kind of kill off the idea of that ideal uh, rhetorician? I would uh, more likely be moving. I'm generally moving away from the idea of ideals. 
<laughs> uh, or, or some kind of idealism. Uh, and uh, the that I mean, just to like think about like a microphone that we're both using microphones right now, uh, but we use microphones differently from the way uh, you know Mick Jagger uses a microphone. Or I don't yeah, pick pick. I mean, I'm really dating myself with my references. I mean, that's older than me. <laughs> I know who Mick Jagger is. <laughs> yeah. So you know, he's I mean, the guy he's... from the song "Moves Like Jagger," right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the... right. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Sorry, <laughs> that didn't one. So yeah, so that that uh, so I do think that you know, there's not necessarily an ideal, and and you know what you what I would you know, sort of briefly draw out from that example is just well, you know, if you're you know, standing on the stage in a rock arena with a microphone in your hand, you're in a very different uh, rhetorical situation, right, than, than we are, right? And so you need the reasons why you're using a microphone are different. And uh, you are interested in different capacities of that microphone, perhaps, than we are interested in. And so uh, my interest is in part, like, for people to consider, study, and try to describe the ways uh, in which technologies can provide us with different capacities for rhetorical action, for communicating, um, without, you know, as they get situated in, in different larger kinds of contexts. As you're talking about that, it seems like um, there could, as things were slower, you know, you talk about faster networks, but you also talk about like the rise and the, like a lot of what you're talking about here is the confluence of social media, mobile tech, faster networks, Internet of Things. Um, there, uh, and you also talk about your your basis in uh, materialism, which I'm sure is a lot of this movement away from ideals. But do you think some of this movement away from ideals also has to do, or the value of an ideal rhetorician has to do with uh, kind of the mobile technology and faster networks? Because when the discourse is more solidified, that like it's easier to to be more rigid and thinking about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I I, I think it. I think that the idea that uh, you could be uh, the ideal rhetorician in a more permanent, long-standing way uh, would rely upon um, technologies having a little bit more endurance than they do now, a little bit more permanence than they do now. So. Uh, you know, if arguably, you know, uh, not to get too partisan on these matters, but, you know, if they were going to say that, you know, uh, Donald Trump gets elected because in part because of his capacity with Twitter, um, you know, is that going to work now that it's X or is it, you know, for him? Who, I mean, is, is it going to have a different role? Uh, you know, is is that the is the, are the presidents of the future? You know, we had. If we go back to the 30s and if it's Churchill and Roosevelt, you know, on the radio or if it's, you know, Mussolini on the radio or, you know, like now we don't have uh, radio presidents. Right. We had Nixon and Kennedy famously doing the first televised debate and Nixon, you know, the, the story about, you know, he didn't want to wear makeup and how that affected his ability. You know, so like these kinds of things about a televised president, a Twitter president, a radio president. Uh, yeah, I mean, so is this? There's no ideal that co that goes across those things, right? Right. I, so if you don't mind, and I, I know this isn't. Uh, it seems uh, important, kind of as the foundation. Can you talk a little bit about the this new materialism? And it obviously kind of extends throughout. But you're not arguing for that. But how does that kind of ground this? Yeah. So uh, new materialism is a philosophical concept that arises in the early 90s. Uh, so it's, you know, arguably it's partly a result of technological change of, you know, the information revolution. It's uh, based upon French philosophy that occurs after uh, the 19, 19, you know, in 1967, right, there were these massive uh, strikes in, in, in uh, Europe and France and stuff. And the, the, the idea that this would create massive political change, which it didn't. And then philosophers, some philosophers kind of changed their way of thinking. People like Gilles Deleuze, uh, for example, a French philosopher. Uh, and a lot of uh, new materialism comes out of Deleuze's work and, and Foucault, other French philosophers of the of that period. 
And uh, really uh, what it's, you know, it's new because the old materialist is Marxist and the uh, new materialist is post-Marxist, I guess. I mean, it's not like a complete rejection of Marxism, but it, it's, a, it's a spreading out of, of trying to understand the ways in which uh, non-humans and materiality shape uh, historical uh, shape our history uh, in in ways that go beyond the kind of narratives that Marxism provides that, you know, focus on like means who owns the means of production, right? I mean, that's kind of like the, the central tacit of, uh, of uh, Marxist philosophy. Uh, is that uh, similar, when you say post-Marxist, is that similar or how would you distinguish that from like post-structuralism? Uh, well, I mean, they are, uh, they are certainly related um, in that, uh, I mean, historically, they're related. They both come out in like the 60s and 70s. Uh, and uh, they share a rejection of grand narratives, right? I mean, Marx gives us this narrative of the proletariat revolution that leads to, you know, a kind of worker's paradise. Um, and of course, we have lots of other narratives in our society and uh, post-structuralism, uh, certainly a rejection of grand narratives or meta narratives as uh, someone like uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard would have talked about another of these French philosophers in the 70s. So there is really this kind of uh, movement and postmodernism, like all of these posts. I You're mean, right, so right. as you could say, it's uh, what like <laughs> one, one story of it is to think about how how the French at, you know, respond to the German, the German occupation during World War II, because we're talking about people that were young folks, like philosophers who were young people during that occupation, right? They were alive. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's certainly a, a part of where um, post-structuralism comes from. Another, another version of it, one of my professors used to say is that, you know, it's the French crisis in German thought. So, you know, it's like, it's Marx and it's Nietzsche and Freud. Okay, he's Austrian. So, uh, you know, like these ideas, uh, like responding to these 19th century philosophers, Heidegger as well, uh, and, and then coming up with something new after the German occupation in France. So uh, of like, maybe those things weren't great ideas or they were incomplete and we want to build on them. Thank you. That, that was honestly more for me personally, because I've, I don't know that I've ever really encountered post-Marxist, but like I've studied uh, Leotard, or at least read, I should study, like I've read Leotard and Foucault. And so I was like, all right, what's the, the connecting bridge there? That's helpful. Thank you. Um, kind of central to your work, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't get to this, you, uh, you kind of start off with a, a very technical definition of rhetorical capacity. Um, what is that and why is it important? Why do we need to understand that? Yeah, so I mean, I think... I mean, part of it is like the, the notion of capacities is sort of broadly available in philosophy. So, uh, so there's a longer story there. Uh, but rhetorical capacity specifically is about how uh, the tools that we have uh, give us different uh, opportunities for action so that instead of thinking about uh, saying, like as a human being, I have innate qualities that allow me to think and to speak and so forth. That uh, those are those th those are capacities, and by capacities, rather than qualities, what we're talking about is something that arises from our interaction with something else, right? So a knife is sharp. And the knife has a capacity to cut, but it only has a capacity to cut something, uh, you know, certain things, right? I mean, like I've got, I can cut a tomato with my knife. I mean, we can go into the Ginsu knife ad, uh, but, you know, I mean, like the, uh, you know, can it cut this or that or whatever? But I mean, like certain things it can't cut, right? So it's got certain capacities, but it can't do any of those things if my hand isn't on it, right? Making it cut. So the two of us have to come together to create the capacity to cut. Right. So to think about, uh, you know, rhetoric is something that is not inside of us. 
um, but rather is something that arises from our interactions with others, with non-humans. And, uh, you know, you have your, you have your author, your text and your audience in some ways you, th you can think of it in that way. Um, but if you talk about it from the, the knife perspective, like the capacity to cut comes from me plus a knife. And I, th I think the thing that uh, most people often miss is that you need the right thing to be cut, right? right. Uh, you could write a great speech, and if you don't have the opportunity to give that speech, it doesn't make a difference. But in the same reason, like you can't. <laughs> uh, it's it's very easy to to think about. Uh, like I have a knife, I can cut things now, and it's like, well, here's a tree. Now, good luck. You know, it's like, ah, I need a saw, right? Like that's like <laughs> the knife will break before you get through that. You know, um, so. Right. Yes. And that's where uh, and that's where the interaction of non-humans is obviously important. Um, uh, how does that work with uh, and I. I uh, what I really appreciate is a, like when you put these phrases together, they sound inside baseball, you know, um, but. Uh, as I sit and think through them, they make sense to me, like sometimes like academic terms, you're like, that doesn't mean anything of what I, <laughs> like, I was like, I was like, that's not what I thought that meant at all. But uh, as you like, I understand like why you're using these terms. Um, when you talk about distributed deliberation, how does that fit? And obviously, like you're you're kind of just slowly working like through what these rhetorical capacities are. But um, so I'd love to kind of follow the structure of your book here. But what is distributed deliberation, and how does that affect us on a, a daily level? Sure. So uh, so the the. The con my concept of distributed deliberation comes from a, a larger concept of distributed cognition, uh, which comes out of, uh, boy, I was trying to remember this guy's name. I, I should have looked it up in my book. Uh, but uh, there's a, a, a guy who wrote a book called uh, Cognition in the Wild. And uh, I can't remember. Why can't I remember his name right now? But it's a book that was written Edward, in the 80s. Edwin Hutchin. Edwin, yes. Thank you. And... Uh, uh, he's a, 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 a in the field of psychology, right? So, I mean, he was what he was looking at is how, like, for example, if you're trying to bring an aircraft carrier into San Diego, like, it's not just the captain of the that's piloting that big old boat right into the like it requires a lot of people and a lot of technologies all working together to perform that task. And we understand that, right? This is a normal. So, like, the idea of that cognitive acts are distributed. Uh, you know, or, or around people and tools in order to be uh, in order to be enacted. And so I think about deliberation. So it's just like, you know, how we decide what we want to do and how do we how do we know how do we do that? Well, it's distributed through uh, like if you want to buy a car, you know, well, you probably do a Google search to find out like what's the best car, what's the good prices. Right. So, you know, we rely on Google to help us make a decision like that's an easy example, I think, of this, right? So, uh, and one of the things I talk about is, well, what's the, what's going on in that relationship with Google, uh, which has people, but is also like, there's no one at Google that knows what's going to show up when you type something in, right, to the search, not exactly. Uh, so, and, but the purpose of Google, of course, a Google search is for you to click on something, Right. And that the purpose of Facebook is for you to click on something and the purpose of Twitter is for you to click on something. And really the purpose of all of most uh, social, you know, Internet sites is for you to click on something and ultimately perhaps to click on the buy button. But I mean, you know that but you're sharing information, you're you're giving up stuff. Uh, and so uh, trying to understand how we now make decisions that we're not making if we were ever making decisions like how we make decisions today uh relies upon our interaction uh with other humans but through the lens through the mediation of uh, these technologies and uh that they are participants in our decision making right because uh, you know you get shown stuff i get shown stuff on the internet and i don't know why necessarily <laughs> right like we all get yeah. these things like, why is this in my YouTube feed? Like, why is it trying to recommend to me to watch that? What's it thinking about? Like, why do these ads show up for me? And, and, and things like that. Right. And we don't necessarily know why, like certain posts get promoted and others get hidden. Why, you know, like there's lots of stuff on YouTube that, you know, 
no one has access, very few people have access to, right? Because it's not promoted in the way that the algorithms function. So algorithms are decision makers that no one really takes a lot of responsibility for, um, but they certainly shape, you know, our conclusions about the world. Like, you know, go do a, a Google search for climate change and see what you come, I'm, you know, I mean, you're going to get different yeah. kinds of stuff, right? Uh, or a Bing search or duck, duck, go search. Yes, like yes. you'll get very different results. Um, that's a, that kind of classic meme going around. Like when you Google, you know, for something, are you Bing for something? <laughs> Your responses are, Oh, okay. That's quite different. Um, th personally, this has been interesting for me. Um, I spend too much time and I, I this is everyone's complaint on YouTube shorts, right? Um, I don't do TikTok because I'm, you know, 35 and, uh, you know, I, I know people my age do TikTok, but I, there's still that small, you know, modicum of, uh, I, I, restraint really gives me way too much, uh, you know, probably just pride, you know, we'll, we'll go with the sin, not a, <laughs> not like, but, uh, not, not a virtue, but, um, and about every six months I'll get a flood of absolute junk. And I, I think it's gotten, uh, better. I'll get an absolute fl uh, flood of junk in my feed about every six months, especially when it was first starting, because certain uh, creators had figured out how to hack the algorithm, <laughs> and I would get just the worst videos, uh, like just the dumbest stuff. And I was like, why, why is this happening all of a sudden? And it would always be like, uh, I'd find out like, okay, they're doing an update in like a week. <laughs> like, they, like, they're like, oh, that's a loophole. Be like lots of bots, like sharing something or... You know, which are these non-human, you know, uh, these non-human actors. Right. And, and you're, uh, you know, if you're making websites, uh, you're probably thinking about search engine optimization, right? And, and those, yeah. those rules are always changing for good reason, right? Because people game the system. And, and so, uh, which is kind of what they're supposed to do, I guess, uh, to some extent. Um, but there is an interesting uh, kind of recursivity there, right? Because you know, the rules change and people try and figure out what they do, what they are. And as soon as they get closed, the rules change again, right? But you've already been shifted in a particular yeah. direction, right? As a creator of websites or web content. Um, and that's actually leads into my next question. You know, you're talking a little about distributed cognition, talking about aircraft carriers, right? Like it's the... There's a lot of brains doing a lot of different things, working towards like this, you know, this purpose. Um, what's the difference between what goes on with carriers and what goes on with this kind of distributed deliberation with clicks and algorithms? There's a feedback loop like you, you don't have it. Your carrier is not getting rebuilt <laughs> on the fly as you're taking it into well, on the on the wave uh, as you're taking it into uh, San Diego. Right. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's probably undergoing continual maintenance but i mean i mm. think that it's it's not the ship of theseus right i mean it's not like uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's too complete it's too complex for that uh but right but i do think that uh so like a user i mean the thing about a, a, a aircraft carrier right is that you've got this massive military hierarchy that's part of organizing it right and the way that people act and respond and but it, and if you're at a university you've got like I am, you've got a, a you know a looser set of of rules, right? That dictate how that space operates, right? So uh, so we can look at different kinds of um, social cultural uh, situations and think about uh, the ways that language and and behaviors and technologies and other materials and histories and cultures or whatever uh, it's all a lot of complex stuff, right? That's why it's difficult to figure out, uh, come together to, to, uh, shape behaviors. But I think about user populations, you know, like, a as Facebook users or whatever, like we all, if you're just the typical user, right? We all have the same generic technical capacities granted by being a user, right? We all sign the same terms of service that we don't read and, uh, that, um, but we have the, you know, we can post certain kinds of media that's certain size and we can like and we can share. And we can like we have these things, right, that shape us as users, right, that get, grant us certain capacities rather than others. And, and so um, that helped to, that those things help to organize our participation. And then you have a little bit of a hierarchy, right, because you could 
uh, you know, create a group and become a group moderator. Like you can, you know, there's a little bit of that kind of stuff that goes on in, in Facebook or other social media. And, and so all of those things can work to regular, to regularize behaviors as, you know, as like we do in normal life where, you know, you say something, you get slapped, you're saying, well, maybe I won't say that again. Uh, you know, I mean, the same thing happens online, right? It's just not physical slap. It probably happens more commonly, right? Because that's the web for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think getting disliked produces a different set of reactions than getting slapped, I think. Like, that's <laughs> that's a whole different... <laughs> Which is why we end up with a very different kind of discourse online, I think. Um, yes, yeah. I would say so. Uh, and that, so, um, but that's a, that's a different thing. Like, and actually, this is great because we talk about like the difference here between talking in person. Yeah, I, I, that, I made a motion with my hands like, like we were talking in person. That's very different discussion. We won't talk about, okay, that's a whole rabbit hole. But, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, but uh, you, your next, uh, your next kind of rhetorical capacity you talk about is synthetic attention, um, and how that is kind of. Would you say that's a new development? I mean, I don't think we've really had anything technologically that way. Or is there something you'd compare it to in the past? Well, I think you could um, compare it to reading a book, okay. right? I mean, in, in a way that uh, you know that's something obviously we all you know people need to learn how to do, and. Um, you know, the whole, there's a whole set of practices historically and, and today, right, about like where you sit in a coffee shop and read a book or you sit, you know, and drink, like you read before you go to bed or whatever it is, right? We create these habits and practices around those things. And it, and it does require, uh, you know, a certain kind of cognitive disposition, right? Uh, which is why, you know, many of my colleagues, you know, come the common complaints of kids these days, they don't read, right? We sign them books and they don't do the reading. And, and, and like, how do we handle that? Or what do we do about that? Uh, you know, and, uh, and so because maybe the students don't have those practices or whatever, we live in a different time. We don't live in the 19th century anymore. Um, you know, so it's, uh, uh, you know, that become so yeah, so I, I do think that, uh, that there are, but but definitely what we have with contemporary technologies is a way that we have, I put it crudely, monetized attention, right? The idea of an attention economy, right, is, is a relatively new concept. Maybe it goes back to like Nielsen ratings or something along those lines, right? But I mean, it's uh, uh, like our, our devices, like in that chapter, I talk a lot about smartphones and the way that if we think about, again, like the capacity to, to attend to something is not something that is integral to me, but is something that is a distribute a capacity, like my capacity to pay attention to something in a certain situation, like all those things have to come together. And I've been trained to be attentive as a scholar and so those things, right? So uh, that the smartphone is designed to organize uh, the way that we attend to uh, digital media, right? And we have a little bit of control over that because we can pick our apps and we can you know, control our notifications and, and things along those lines. But, uh, and we can talk about the technical aspects of how a smartphone can actually work and when it pays it, like how it draws up information and how it, how it gets triggered and things like that. But and we can also think more critically about, right, the why, why, why do smartphones work the way they do? Why, like, why do we want this thing in our pocket that's constantly reminding us to, or demanding that we do something, right? And, uh, but we do. So it's, uh, you know, uh, so, so for me, you know, it's thinking about, well, maybe we do need something like if we do want to be connected to this synthetic world of media and information, we need some tool to help us do that, right? Because we don't, we can't just like eat a hard drive and le learn what's on it, right? I mean, we have to have some way of accessing it. So, um, so these are tools, right, to do that. Uh, and, and they sort of shape the things that we pay attention to. 
right? So, uh, yeah, that's kind of where, you know, think, so, so I, you know, my book is in some ways about negotiating uh, those, those relationships, like realizing that they are relationships and then figuring out what do we want out of them. Yeah, actually, I realized I kind of jumped the gun here. Can you, for our audience, explain what synthetic attention is and how that fits in with uh, what you call close hyper machines? Oh, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, more inside baseball. Yeah. So the uh, so synthetic intention is uh, just my way of say of of highlighting that attention is not just something that we have, but is something that is created that's built with technologies. Um, you know, like uh, chalk, you know, just think about a whole, like a classroom or an auditorium, right? I mean, that it's designed, you go to a theater, you sit in the dark in rows, right? Like that's all designed to make you pay attention to some, to the screen, right? So we, so these things are all synthesized, right? So that, uh, so that's part of it. And then, so the, the close hyper machine, uh, it kind of has to, it draws upon a, conversa a conversation that comes out of the work of an uh, another scholar, Catherine Hales, who uh, talks about different kinds of reading practices. Uh, you know, close reading is like a term from literary studies. It's about, you know, reading closely, <laughs> like re looking very, like at the particular words and the choices and, and, and the syntax and, and those elements rather than just trying to get the ideas, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, we have close reading, which requires people. We have uh, machine reading, right, which is the reading that machines do. And then, like Hales talks about what she calls hyper reading, which is kind of what, you know, quote unquote, kids these days do, right, where they've got multiple screens up and, uh, you know, windows and different kinds of things calling their attention and they're shifting back and forth, right, between different kinds of material. And so, like I talk about the smartphone as a, like an integration of those things, right? Because it's close to us, it's intimate, it's a personal device. I don't know that we feel, have a degree, I mean, maybe like, you know, the stereotype is guys in their cars, right? That they feel intimate about, uh, but that uh, like the phone is really intimate, a device, right? We don't really share our phones with other people and stuff like that. So it's so it's a personal, intimate thing. It's hyper because uh, I mean it's spasmodic, right? I mean it's just like who knows when that thing's going to buzz and what's going to what it's going to say. And I think that's in a way kind of like what's exciting and addictive about social media. It's more like it's less like smoking a cigarette than it is like, you know, the one armed bandit in Vegas, right? I mean, you don't know what's going to come up, but both are addictive <laughs> in different ways, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, so those, those kinds of things. And then the machine, right? I mean, obviously, the it's a like what the part of what the smartphone does is it takes uh, technical you know, binary digital data and transforms it, it reads it and then turns it into something that is uh, attractive, engaging to us. It's informational, communicative to us, right? So uh, we look at our phones that, you know, like we hold these things on our bodies, they keep buzzing. I always used to you know, like get these like phantom buzz, like, I think, is that my phone buzzing or is it just my, <laughs> something, something else is, or it's just happy to see me. I mean, I think that it's no. just, yeah. uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, that it's just, uh, you know, like we have these uh, responses to these, these uh, visceral responses to, to these technologies that then take us down a media rabbit hole and we never know when it's going to happen. Right. Exactly. And uh, that we kind of live our lives around, having our attention synthesized, created for these purposes. And uh, that's the way that we decide to interact with the massive mediascape that we're now a part of. Um, and why do we do that? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I don't, you know, should we do something else? Maybe, what should it be? I don't know. But, you know, how do we, how do we even have that conversation? Right. Um, and just saying the old ways are better has almost never worked. I can't think of really uh, an example does not come to mind where just saying <laughs> that the old ways are better works. No, you can't. So, I mean, for no. good or bad, you know, uh, we don't have a time machine. So, you know, I mean, it's the, the future isn't the past. Um, we can learn things from the past, but 
we can't, you know, we can't live there. So uh, we already did. Yeah, like we can't, uh, for instance, uh, whether we want to recover thinking from before, like a modern period, we would never be pre-modern. We will always be, we're just redefining what postmodern is, right? Like you can't, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, we can't just ignore that this stuff happened and that people have said it, right? And so even if you want to change, and so if you wanted to recover things like reading, it's going to have to be, uh, you let, let's, for instance, if you wanted to recover reading, and again, not to say that that's what needs to uh, happen, but uh, past, uh, like past habits of reading never had to deal with a cell phone world. So it's going to be, it is going to be a, t a different thing, a different setup, a different uh, set of like, um, I put on uh, my phone on do not disturb all the time because I get like, <laughs> otherwise I was finding myself like, bing, bing, you know, uh, especially if I'm, I'm the system administrator for like a lot of websites and oh my gosh, the amount of just, yeah, anyways. Um, uh, even as you're talking about that, I, I think of, uh, have you, I'm sure you've experienced this where you're in a group and you ha like everyone has the default um, notification sound and everyone reaches for their phones at once, right? Like it's like, it's your attention has been created, right? Like it's, uh, it's really, really strange. Uh, this reminds me a lot. I had an earlier episode uh, where I had uh, a UX professional who uh, had been kind of leading a, a charge for kind of the craftsman side of things, uh, talking about unethical design and, um, you know, talking about the, the way that uh, for a while, you know, we used to have pages on Google, you know, and now it's become infinite scrolling. Everything, everything has become infinite scrolling because it grabs attention better. Um, uh, hiding, uh, and, I mean, this is where we get into, like, that's a, a different discussion where you could argue about the ethics of it. Um, in the middle of that, I found out why my grandma had been charged a subscription instead of a one-time purchase because they had hidden that it was actually a subscription in really small print for her, right? Like, and that's truly unethical, right? Like, there's like all these different layers to, to this sort of uh, discussion. And so then you have things like, uh, you're talking about like, they start shaping the, the capacities that we have where it's like, no, 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 if it's going to be, you know, like literally this stuff can start, well, I don't know if it has yet, but I think it might start coming down from Congress. If you're going to, if it's going to be, be bought, it has to be a certain size font, right? Like you have to have, you know, just stuff like that. Um, go yeah, ahead. No, I you, mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I, certainly we can talk about laws that can be created. And I know that, you know, right now there's a lot of stuff going on about generative AI and kids, right? And, mm. and youth and, uh, you know, that... We often start off by talking about, well, what about the children uh, is a, you know, a, a useful rhetorical place, right, that people will attend to uh, as a way of talking about these things, because we always think, well, we're adults, we can control ourselves or something. Right. You know I, mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know who, oh, what man. adults those people are, are dealing with. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> not oh. me. They're not dealing with me. No, no, I know. Yeah, I I, yeah, I my wife got a, a slice of cheesecake, and I know that I can't eat it. And I, I was like, you know, I'm just gonna have a couple bites. And I was just up all night, and I'm just like, <laughs> it's been years since I've done this. Why did I do it this time? You know, it's just like it's like, oh yeah. But the kids are the ones. The kids are the ones that need to be protected. Yeah, no. <laughs> yes, the kids need to be protected for sure. I mean, the you know laws and and like uh, you know ten tips to reduce your phone use or just you know any like here here's how you should set up the the settings on your phone so that you, like all those kind of, like privacy settings and and all those things. Those are all good things, right? That we need to do and and. Uh, you know, they're part of the way that the institutions we have that are available to us can help us to address these issues. But at the same time, uh, they're all kind of based on, a, you know, a, a basic conception of humanness as, you know, rational animals who can, uh, you know, with given a fair shake can make, will make good decisions. Right. I mean, that that's like what democracy is about. Right. Um, and uh, the, the faith of democracy, right, is the faith in the capacity of citizens to make rational choices. And um, 
right? <laughs> I mean, I don't yeah, know. yeah, right. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, when you but, put it like that, it's a little depressing, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, is. it could be. Uh, and, uh, so, but if we don't, I mean, if we start thinking about humans in a different way, right, which is more like the post-human kind of way of thinking about it, it you know, it's, we, you know, we don't, we think about rationality and thought and decision making as things that are environmental, that they're the actions of populations that are both human and non-human, that there are these assemblages and networks and things along those lines, then um, it you start to think that either, you know, like, not that laws won't work, but that laws need to be framed on a different expectation for what humans are which I think is, uh, you know, we're not there. So, you know, yeah, I was, really. yeah, I was about to ask it. It sounds like, I mean, uh, it sounds to me like we're tying back to the, your earlier discussion of moving away from ideals or at least ideal actors for sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, because <laughs> so you, you have a different idea of democracy that you're like a new type of democracy to match the new materialism where it's like, you're constantly like, we're, we're looking for, uh, uh, the ideal citizen, the the rational, logical, and it's like, have you met the citizen? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, to be clear, I mean, I, I put myself in that category. I'm not trying to say if only you, you know, got a college degree. It's not about that, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, um, it's it's about kind of it's about our ontology. It's about our being, right? It's about who we are, what we are. And, and uh, trying to understand that better uh, than we than we currently do. When we think about a different democracy, well, there's uh, this other French philosopher, his name is Bruno Latour, that I talk a fair about about in the book, and uh, he he talks about this idea of a democracy of things, um, and the, what he calls a, a non-modern constitution uh, that has to do with recognizing that the role that uh, inanimate, non-human actors uh, play in in our society. And I think probably the easiest way to think about that is when we talk about representation, right? Like in, in democracy, right? We have represent people that represent us, right? So that's one form of representation. Another form of representation is what we have in language, right? So, uh, you know, language represents things, right? So science, like science is a representation of the natural world, right? But to be able to create those representations, right? You need a lab, you need all these non-humans and to be able to write and all these things. And that's really, that's where Latour's work came out of. He was kind of like a sociology of, sociologist of science, science practices and stuff. That's kind of where he started. So, uh, so we think about uh, a democracy of things and how, we, how the world gets represented to us in order to be able to deliberate and do the things that democratic societies do, then we have to realize that it's not just the humans that are involved, right? And so, I mean, we make rules and laws about the non-humans, but we don't necessarily uh, hear them and recognize the role that they play. And uh, so we can think about like climate change as an example of of that, right? So that's kind of tangential to the, the subject matter of my book, but... Um, you know, it's, I think, an obvious example. Well, I, I mean, even as we're, uh, what, what I see, at least from the government, and this is my not greatly informed opinion, but it constantly feels like they're playing catch up to technology. And I think you mentioned something about like being generative in the field, like trying to shape forward instead of just like, oh, no, we don't want that. And uh, so even as we talk about things like, um, and Honestly, how much, well, we've always had kind of those laws about technology. We've had laws about radio waves. We've had laws about television, um, but it's always been reactive and it hasn't been so explosive. But with the advent of things like AI and those sorts of things, uh, part of what uh, it sounds to me, and I want to just make sure I'm tracking with you, is that you want uh, a recognition of purposes and goals and kind of like, like a uh, and shaping those things so that we're, we're not reacting until after the damage is done. Is that, a, is that one way to talk about it? Uh, yeah, I, I, yes, I think so. I think we do need to imagine um, new ways of 
new forms of community, new ways of being as as individuals, uh, you know, that are that recognize our interdependence uh, with a natural world, with a cultural material world uh, that we arise from, and uh, that that is the context in which we will continue to live or not. And uh, that we, you know, I think it, it, it orients us differently uh, than the way that we are, are currently oriented. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think, you know, a lot, you know, has to do with how people, you know, what people believe about the world, right? I mean, if you're, you know, if you believe in a, in like a Judeo-Christian God, then maybe you feel like you know what it's all about. And um, so maybe you're not concerned. Um, I don't know. Um, but, you know, that it that at least you know what the purpose is. Like, you know, like you have oh, an idea. You yeah. believe you know where everything's supposed to go and end up, right? So, uh, and, and so maybe like that directs your decision making. But if you don't have that, or if you live in a society where, you know, people have a lot of ideas about what that answer is, even though they all believe in a God, but they believe different things about it, uh, which is certainly where we are globally, uh, then um, maybe that isn't a workable solution uh, for a collective. So we have to figure out how to do something differently that thinks about us, thinks about humans in a different way, because the, those older ideas no longer uh, suit us in you know, no longer provide us with the capacities that we need to face the challenges that we face with emerging technologies and climate change and these sort of global conditions that, uh, I mean, I would argue that our, you know, our predecessors in the historical moments in which these religions emerged, they were not in a, situated to be able to address these questions uh, in the way that we need to address them now. Um. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, and so, and I want to be respectful of you know, what you're trying to accomplish with this book. So I won't ask you for a prescription of where we should head. Um, Cause you make that, <laughs> that's not your goal here, but if you could um, for uh, our audience, for the listener, as they go throughout this week, what, how should they think about what's, what's a, a fundamental shift that they can kind of meditate on throughout the week that would help them better understand uh, the way that um, rhetoric works among the digital non-humanities? I would say um, to uh, pay attention to the way that you use social media, because well, most of the time we don't. And again, I include myself, right, that uh, it's a distraction or, or something like this. Um, to pay attention to, you know, like, what we click on and why, why we do that and what decision we made based upon something like, why did we buy that? Or why did we, why did we like that or something? And it's, uh, it's not something you could do all week long, but maybe you could, you know, try and at the end of the day, think about like something that you did and try and figure out why you did it. Or like, as you go in, like, as you're going about using your device to just, you know, stop for a moment, and think about like, wow, you know, 15 years ago, I didn't have one of these. What would I else, what would I have been doing? Why am I doing this now? Uh, and um, yeah, just just start to think about and look around and see all the other, like, why are those people doing what they're doing? And, and uh, you know, just to be able to be more attentive to it and maybe, you know, have an inspiration, you'll have an insight and you can share it with somebody. And it's a conversation. So that would be. A starting point. Yeah, I, with something like this, I think uh, just creating conversation is the first start. And that's obviously the goal of your book. Um, uh, Dr. Reed, wonderful to have you on today. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much. <laughs>